I want to welcome everyone to our fourth seminar. We'll have a very nice topic on population genomics. Um, and I leave the floor to Marie to introduce yeah. to us our two nice speakers. Hello, everyone. Good morning. So first of all, thank you to our speakers today, Vitor and Joao, for accepting our invitation to talk about PULSIC. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about both of them, Vitor, he is currently the group leader of the Evolutionary Genetics Group at the Center of Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Changes in Lisbon, Portugal. And he works on population genomics. He did his PhD at the Gulbeckian Science Institute. And then he went uh, to the Rutgers University to do a postdoc and also with Lauren Escoffier in Switzerland. Uh, Joao, he's a master, he has a master in evolutionary and developmental biology from the University of Lisbon. And he is currently a PhD in Vitor Group. And I he, they are going to be talking about how to infer demographic history with population genomics, the challenges of PULSIC data. So you are welcome to start, Vitor and Joao. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be at this uh, seminar of the Data Analysis Committee. Uh, I was, when Erga started, I was attending the meetings of this committee uh, and I hope I can uh, come back. So it's a pleasure to now be telling you about our work, mostly about the PhD work of Schwell, uh, but I'll present uh, part of the um, talk and then I'll give the floor to Schwell. So can you see our screen? Yes. Okay, and now in presentation mode, right? Yes, okay, good. So, um, um, yeah, so I don't know, Sean, if you want to say good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I hope this will go well. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the topic is about inferring demographic history with population genomics, and we'll just try to connect. Um, so Erge, Erge is about uh, generating high quality reference genomes for species, but to infer demographic history, very often we need population data. So we need to collect several individuals uh, in order to characterize polymorphisms. Uh, and so I'll try to give you some examples of how we can do that. Um, and then, sorry, how can we have the pointer? Um, okay, can you see our mouse? Yeah, okay. So then um, I will just give you an example of how we can infer demographic history and what we can do with population genomic data when we have individual genotype calls, so when we are able to get data from each individual, and then uh, what we can do with PULSIC, and I'll explain a bit what is PULSIC and what are the advantages and challenges, and how we've been working on modeling and simulating PULSIC uh, data sets in order to perform inference of demographic history parameters. Uh, and João will then talk about examples uh, from his work on speciation genomics to distinguish a single versus parallel origin of ecotypes and also illustrate uh, the application of two R packages that João and we have developed uh, to analyze this type of data. Okay, so why do we care uh, about demographic history and what is demographic history? So demographic history characterizes um, um, all the events related with the relationship between populations, like if populations split, we can date the time of split between populations, we can estimate the effective sizes of different populations and estimate the migration rates and changes in uh, all these parameters. So we can be interested in understanding if populations are expanding or collapsing, if migration rates are decreasing and so on. And of course, this is interesting in itself um, because very often we want to understand if populations are collapsing, we want to date the split between populations, or we want to quantify migration rates. And for genomic um, population 
economics, a key assumption is that this demographic history, these events affect the genome-wide patterns. So they affect the genome-wide all in a similar way. Um, and at the same time, demographic history is also important to characterize and understand because it will affect the efficiency of natural selection. So for instance, the removal of the deleterious mutations is expected to work differently in large and small populations. Or for instance, the fate of beneficial mutations involved in adaptation can be affected by uh, migration and gene flow from other populations. So this is why we want to use population genomics data to go from collecting the data that by itself doesn't say much. Uh, and so today with population genomics data, we have lots of tools and statistics to quantify and characterize genetic diversity within and between populations to characterize genetic differentiation patterns. And even we have lots of what I call model-free methods like PCA um, and methods of clustering to group individuals according to genetic similarity. But very often, it's very difficult to link these patterns, what we observe with these statistics, to the underlying evolutionary processes. And to do that, I argue that we need model-based methods. So we need methods where we have parameters that quantify effective sizes, the times of split, and the migration rate. Accounting for the demography, mutation, recombination, and hopefully selection, which I will ignore for most of the talk. We will ignore for most of the talk. Um, uh, so how can we use reference genomes to infer demographic history? So I think um, one of the main uh, breakthroughs in the methods to infer demographic history was this method called PCMC, uh, published in 2011 by Leon Durbin, that based on uh, diploid whole genome data from a single diploid individual. So if we had a reference genome composed of the two uh, copies of each chromosome in a diploid species, it's possible to infer changes in effective size. And these plots became very common in many um, studies of demographic history of population genomics. And so on the x-axis, we have the years going from the present on the left to the past, deep past on the right. And the y-axis, we have the effective population size. Here in a, um, so in units of thousands. So two is 2,000 and so on. Um, and so each line is an estimate of the changes of the effective size through time for each individual. So this is an example of a study with chimpanzees and bonobos. Uh, led by um, um, my, um, Thomas Marcus Bonnet from Barcelona that I participated, where we inferred the changes in the effective sizes for each individual, okay? And in principle, with a reference genome, if we have the two copies, it would be possible to infer these um, changes in effective size. However, for most model-based methods based on single nucleotide polymorphism data, they require population resequencing data. So we need data for many individuals. Uh, and there are several methods to um, use individual genotypes from SNP uh, data sets. And here I just want to give you an example of a study uh, I participated on uh, neodiprin Leconte the Contii subplies that um, have this distribution area in North America. And this was in collaboration with Catherine Linen from Kentucky University. And I chose this example because it's population data based on DDRAT data. So it's a reduced representation technique. And here we had a very high quality reference genome for this species. And then based on this DDRAT, we collected eight individuals from 77 localities. And these soft flies live in different hosts, uh, pine tree species, and it was collected from 13 host pine tree species. Um, so we used individual genotypes, uh, and we were able to get data at roughly 11,000 uh, SNPs with a high depth of coverage uh, of more than 10x. 
And what we found is that we have here these structure plots uh, where we could characterize that there was some population structure with three subdivisions, um, north here, the central cluster, and the southern cluster, that correspond to some differences in the phenotypes. But then these are the patterns. And we wanted to go further. We wanted to infer the demographic history of these populations. So what's the split time between these three clusters? What is the effective size? And is there evidence of gene flow between them? And so we apply these methods based on individual genotypes. And based it with that, we could infer uh, this model here on the left, where we have the north cluster that we infer to have a much smaller effective size, and that's given by this very thin uh, population. So here we have years before present in the y-axis, going from the present to the past. And based on this SNP data with 10,000 SNPs, we were able to infer uh, that north and central split more or less 25,000 years ago, um, and that central had a larger effective size, that ancestral of these two had a very large ancestral size, uh, and the south had an intermediate, and that split uh, later. Also, we were able to infer that there were this gene flow mostly between central and south, and less um, uh, from central into north. Okay, so this is represented by the dash arrows uh, that indicate almost no gene flow. And then we could relate this also with statistics of the diversity or expected heterozygosity uh, with latitudinal and longitudinal uh, coordinates to suggest that uh, there was these range expansions also uh, in these different areas. So this is just to motivate that we can infer demographic history with individual genotype data. The problem is that for many species, it's still expensive and difficult to get individual um, genotypes at many SNPs for each individual. So this is where uh, we have now the ability to have full seek data. So in this scheme, which is taken from this paper uh, of 2016, we can have individual samples where for each individual, we get whole genome sequencing and we get the genotypes at each position. If we use PoolSeq, it's much cheaper because we just do the extraction of DNA and the library prep, we can do everything together by pooling individuals. And that means that rather than having data for each individual, we'll have data for the mix of all the individuals. That still allow us to get allele frequencies, uh, even though we lose the genotype information. But still, we can do a lot with allele frequencies. And also, we can have this individual sampling if we use reduced representation during sequencing, like RAT-seq, where RAT, instead of sequencing the whole genome, we just get data at some specific regions of the genome, close to uh, restriction um, enzyme cut sites. And we can do the same with PULC. So for the same number of reads and uh, gigabase of data, with PoolSeq, we can obtain allele frequencies for more individuals than calling genotypes for each individual. And also another advantage is that today, the price of the library prep very often is almost the same cost as sequencing. So here, notice that if we do individual genotyping, we need to have one library prep for each individual. And here, we just need one library prep uh, for the pool. So we can reduce a lot of the costs. So uh, this is just a slide summarizing what I said. With PoolSeq, we have the ability to estimate allele frequencies. And it has been shown that this can allow us to detect fine population structure. Because since we can include more individuals, we can detect more slightly differences in allele frequencies. So it's a cost-effective approach to obtain allele frequencies across many populations or time points. Uh, so uh, we can also um, get uh, different time points. Uh, also, for some practical reasons, for some species, uh, and I've been working, for instance, with spider mites, where they are so tiny that because of the small size and low DNA quantity, we always need to pull individuals in order to be able to extract them. 
Yet, despite these advantages, so far there's only a few methods allowing us to analyze this type of post data. And in particular, to infer demographic history, uh, there's not many. Uh, and the reason is that there are lots of challenges when we are dealing with this uh, pool seek. The first one is that there are, we can have errors due to variation in the depth of coverage. So here on the left, I'm showing you the individual samples. So we have two SNMs. And let's imagine for simplicity that individuals are haploid. Okay? So they only have one allele um, at each SNM. So here we have, if we had individual genotyping, we would be able to infer that this individual here was an A, this individual was also an A, this was a T, and this was an A. So if we had genotypes or individual data, we would know that the frequency of the T would be one quarter. And for this second SNP, it would be the frequency of C would be one half. When we have pool samples, we will get our allele frequencies as the proportion of reads with each allele. So for instance, here at this SNP, if we had the depth of coverage of six X and we had four reads with the A allele, and two reads with the T allele, we would say that the frequency of the allele T was two divided by six, which is one third, right? So you see that just because of the variation in the number of reads, since we define the allele frequency as the proportion of reads with a given allele at each snake, just the variation in the depth of coverage, which is just a stochastic process of uh, the, the sequencing, uh, can lead to biases in allele frequencies. So notice here that the frequency if we knew the genotypes was one quarter. And here in this example, with a low coverage of six X, it would be one third. And here with a very low coverage, it would be even further bias of one third. So we need to have a way to account for this. We need to have a way to account for this depth of coverage variation. A second and related issue is that we can have errors due to the unequal individual contribution. So since we are pooling individuals, and again, on the left, we have the individual samples, on the right, we have the pool samples. Since we are pooling individuals, just by chance, because of um, either the library prep steps or the DNA extraction step, it can happen that some individuals will be overrepresented. So in this example, notice here that individual one, um, if we had individual genotypes, each individual would, we would know the genotype. But in a pool, step, pool, pool sample, it can happen that this individual one can be overrepresented. So it would contribute with four copies or four reads or a proportion of four reads more. And some individuals just by chance can have no contribution. And this can lead to changes in allele frequencies. So in this case, it can lead to a frequency of zero. So we would lose this T allele. So we need to account for these two sources of um, variation. And so this is how we uh, come up with models to model these two sources of uh, variation. So first, we model the depth of coverage variation across the genome. Uh, second, we, uh, yes, we model the contribution of cross pools. Uh, and this is because sometimes for uh, technical reasons, people do pools of pools. Okay, so for instance, they have, uh, they put five individuals together and then they, they extract the DNA of five individuals, but then they do a library preparation of, uh, 10 groups of five individuals, okay? So we also need to account for this uh, contribution of cross pools. And more importantly, related to what I just explained, we need to model this variation of contribution across individuals, and then we get the allele frequencies. And this model is, uh, so here there are some details. I don't think we need to go into the uh, details of the, um, modeling per se, but so we use different distributions. So the coverage has a negative binomial. We use the multinomial Dirichlet distribution for the contribution of pools and the contribution of uh, each individual within each pool. 
And also, we also included sequencing errors. So we also modeled the fact that we can have sequencing errors. And the big novelty of this approach compared to previous ones is that we explicitly account for all these possibilities of error with parameters. Okay, and, and so we can see what's the impact of changing those uh, pool error parameters. Then um, to perform inferences, we use approximate Bayesian computation methods. And these methods are quite flexible because rather than using likelihood functions, which is difficult and very often to write the a closed formula or to have analytical formulas for the likelihood, here we can use simulations. Uh, and we can use simulations uh, to obtain posterior probabilities, to, to estimate parameters and to compare models. And the idea is that we simulate data. For the simulated, we compute summary statistics that we can also compute for the observed data. And then we can imagine that we have this here, this distribution. So we have the, the statistics on the x-axis, the parameter value on the y, and each point here is a simulation. So for different parameter values, we have different statistics. And then these lines correspond to the observed data. So we will only accept the parameter values that make simulations close enough to our observed data. And it turns out that it can be demonstrated that these accepted points uh, near the observed data correspond to uh, a sample from the posterior distribution. And so we can use this to estimate uh, parameters. And therefore, since we have a model, um, as I said, with these different parameters for pool C, we have a tool to simulate pool C, and therefore we can make inference. And, um, and so we implemented, uh, I mean, we, uh, mostly the work of João, of his PhD, uh, but we implemented um, a method to perform demographic history using ABC, so using approximate Bayesian computation based on simulations. And one of the first questions we had was, if we use pool seek data, ignoring these different sources of error, so ignoring the depth of coverage variation and ignoring pool seek, uh, what, sorry, actually here it was just ignoring the unequal individual contribution, what would that affect the, the parameter estimates? So here we have on the x-axis a parameter that we tried to infer, which was the relative size of the present-day population. And on the y-axis, we have the density. So these are the posterior distributions. Uh, and so you see that, and this was, so this vertical line is the correct parameter value. So if the methods were working correctly, we should get a distribution close to this vertical black line. What you can see is that if we ignore pool C, we would get a very biased estimate, as if this population had a very small effective uh, relative effective size. Whereas if we model these different sources of error, we get closer to the true value. You can also see that we have a wider uncertainty. So our credible intervals or confidence intervals um, for those of you that are not used to Bayesian statistics. So these credible intervals would be wider, but the nice thing is that it would include the two parameters. So if we ignore these full seek errors when performing demographic history, it can lead to bias results. So then, and I'll finish, I'll give the word to João soon. Uh, we did a simulation study to validate this method that we propose accounting for pool seek data. And the way we do the simulation methods is that we simulate pseudo observed data where we know the true parameter values. Then we run our methods, we infer the parameters based on our method, and then we compare our estimates with the known true parameter values. And so if our method is working correctly, we should get uh, close estimates. And we did this under different uh, models uh, that Juan will explain in more detail soon, where we have models with four populations so uh, that split at different time points uh, with different migration rates between populations. And 
even trying to account for selection, creating barrier loss in some proportions of the gene. So we had these models with four populations uh, to study ecotype formation. And one first question was, can we use pool seek data to distinguish between these two models, a single origin or a parallel origin? And indeed, with pool seek data, we performed the simulation study where when we when the true data was of a parallel origin model, we detected in 87% of the cases that this was the correct model. And similar, if the true was a single origin, we could also correctly estimate the single origin in 85% of the times. Um, and the nice result is that we never got the wrong answer or very, very few cases. Most of the times, if we, we couldn't, it was unclear. So our posterior probabilities were uh, not very decisive to select a model. I'm just going to show you also this type of plots that we obtained, where on the x-axis, we have the true parameter, in this case, the true time of split. On the y-axis, we have the estimated. And each point is a replica. So we repeated this many times. And if the method was working perfectly, everything should be in the diagonal line. So if we had the perfect method, our estimated should be exactly the same as the true. You see here that there's some uncertainty, but most of the times the method works well, and it also works better for, in this case, the single origin. And this is for the migration rates, showing that it also works uh, reasonably well. Okay, so in summary, uh, PoolSeq offers uh, a way to obtain population genomic allele frequencies along the genome, and by explicitly modeling an equal individual contribution, and variation in depth of coverage and sequencing errors, we were able to perform demographic history analysis using uh, an approximate Bayesian computation approach. And I'll give the floor to João, which will illustrate the application of this method to a biological example in speciation genomics. Thank you, Vita. Uh, so I don't know how much time I have left. 13 minutes. Uh, so the Basically, the main question during my PhD work was to distinguish between different scenarios of archetype information. And we had uh, a lot of PULSIC data available to, to study this uh, archetype formation in the Saxarily. So it was a, a logical step to include this demographic modeling of PULSIC data and try to use PULSIC data in demographic inference. But so first, what are ecotypes? For those of you who don't know, well, ecotypes can be defined as spatially distinct populations that exhibit divergent adaptation to alternative environments. And they are normally thought of as an, and understood as a, a good evidence for the role of natural selection in driving the diversification process. And so for this reason, there are, they have been studied and described in several species, for instance, in monkey flowers and stick insects, and maybe more iconically on uh, sticklebacks. So um, ecotypes and ecotype formation has been studied in different systems, and it's always um, a good evidence for the role of natural selection in driving speciation and diversification. So a common question when we find these ecotypes in multiple, in multiple species, so not only in those three, are also in the species that I studied during my PhD, which is the Canine Saxaralis. When we find these ecotypes spread out across multiple locations, it's normal to wonder what is the origin of this repeated evolution of phenotypic traits as a consequence of adaptation to similar environments. So in other words, what is the origin of these ecotypes? And uh, normally, previous studies have considered then when, then when they do a model free analysis, so when they do cluster analysis, the individuals cluster by location rather than by ecotype, this is normally considered as a signature of parallel evolution. However, we can um, consider two broad contrasting scenarios for ecotype formation, which was the uh, two models that Victor showed you earlier. But so we can 
consider that the ecotypes either have a single origin, then they spread out and colonize all the other locations where we find the ecotypes presently, which is represented by this population tree here, or um, contrastingly, they could have a parallel origin where we have some sort of kind of an ancestral-like population at each of the locations, and then the ecotypes diverge independently at each of those of, the, of those locations. And when we do a kind of a clustering or a, a mixture plot of those of those two hypotheses, you would expect that the individual should cluster by epitype if they had a single origin and by location if they had a parallel origin. So here we have two different locations, location one and location two, and the genetic clustering analysis should show the ecotype clustering by location because they share a common evolutionary history, given that they evolved independently at those regions. However, it's difficult to distinguish between the parallel origin and single origin scenario if there is gene flow between the divergent ecotypes at each of those locations because the patterns that we expect under each scenario can be confounded by introgression between the, the ecotypes. So we could obtain the same admixture plots even if the ecotypes had a, a single origin instead of a parallel origin, we could see, still see them clustering by location rather than by ecotype. So is it even possible to distinguish between these two scenarios of ecotype formation? No, as we can already show you, it's possible. But to do this, uh, we have to use population genomic data and we have to explicitly model these two alternative scenarios and compare them. So during my PhD, I, as I mentioned, I worked with uh, Liturina saxaralis, which is a species of marine gastropod that inhabits this uh, intertidal zone, which is kind of a cool laboratory, natural laboratory for local adaptation because there are a bunch of selective pressures and biotic uh, and abiotic factors that interact in, in like a mosaic pattern. So it forms a bunch of niches and uh, selective pressures that vary quite drastically across a span of a few meters. So, and uh, one of the main pressures in Neutrino saxados and in other Neutrino uh, species is uh, crab predation and or and wave exposure. And so in Litrina sac satellites, we can find across their distribution, which is very widely distributed across the North Atlantic, we can find at multiple shores and multiple locations two um, differently, differently adapted ecotypes. So we have a crab ecotype, which is larger as a thicker shell and a small aperture. And we have a wave ecotype, which, which is smaller as a thin shell and, and as a larger aperture. So uh, one of the, I, basically I studied a very diff, many different models, always adding more complexity. At, and at the end, this was kind of the models that we tested uh, at the end of, the, of my PhD, but you don't really need to know all of these details and all of this parameter parameter names just to can you can see that there are the models reflect the two different um, hypotheses of ecotype formation and there's a split of uh, ancestral populations into the two ecotypes and there is the possibility of migration between divergent ecotypes and also between uh, the same ecotypes in everything different locations so then we applied the, our um method where we combine the demographic inference using an ABC framework with simulations of pulse data explicitly accounting for the sources of error associated with pulse And we applied these methods to pulse data from, uh, for Littorina Saxalis from uh, two locations, one in Sweden and another in Spain. And when we did this, we found that the parallel origin of ecotype formation was strongly supported for those for those populations, so the posterior probability of the reach of the parallel origin was close to one when using the rejection algorithm, and it was one when using the regression algorithm. So it's clearly the scenario that has the highest support for those comparing those two far away populations. 
And so br briefly, just to give you a few, uh, an overview of the same parameters that we just showed, showed you the prediction errors for, we infer that there was a geographical split between Spain and Sweden that occurred roughly 278,000 years, years ago. ago. While the ecotypes that are more um, recent origin occurring roughly um, 15,000 years ago in Sweden and roughly 57,000 years ago in Spain. And these graphs show you the, as we explained, the posterior distribution of the, of the parameters. So you have the density and you have the year, you have the relative time of the recent split and year of the ancient split. And in blue, you can see the distribution of the prime, which was a uniform distribution. Yeah, maybe if I can just comment that, okay, we should speed up. up. Yeah, but mm -hmm. just notice that there's still a huge credible interval. Yes. So there's still a huge uncertainty. So, but yeah. Okay, maybe, yeah. So, we, and then to show you all the other parameter um, that we show the prediction error for, which was, was the migration rate between the divergent ecotypes. We also, at the far M, M scale, we also detect some evidence for the for uh, migration between the divergent ecotypes. So we conclude that those ecotypes and the divergence process occurred in the presence of gene flow, and they are maintained now despite gene flow between the divergent ecotypes. So to conclude a bit this part of more application to, um, to a model system, basically we find a demographic history that is consistent with the spatial division of an, of an ancestral population due to a Spanish ancestral population and the Swedish ancestral population with the ecotypes originating in parallel at each of those locations. We also find that there's evidence for gene flow between the divergent ecotypes and we show that integrating pool six simulations with approximate Bayesian computation enables the exploration of ecotype formation and parallel evolution, which is, um, I think, quite relevant because to study this process of ecotype formation and parallel evolution, you obviously need to sample and obtain population genomic data from multiple populations across maybe a wide distribution. So it's, I think it's um, uh, cool that PulseSec allows you to study these questions because I think it's highly appropriate to this kind of research question. Okay, and now if we can still have five minutes, well, he had prepared an R yes, demo, we'll but, the R uh, demo. Yes, but he at least, we can share the slides of the package and the input yeah. files and the output files. Yeah. yeah. And so basically during my PhD, we developed two different packages. One is more tailored towards the simulation of PulseSeq data and, and to help researchers design uh, PulseSeq experiments. And this is available in the CRIME website and in this publication, Methods in Ecology and Evolution. And so basically this is what it what pool and it's called pool helper. Sorry, I forgot to mention. So this package is basically a method to simulate pool sequencing implemented in R, and it aims to provide users with a tool to choose the appropriate sampling design when conduct conducting experiments that require pool sequencing. So what can this uh, pool helper package do? do? It allows you to simulate pool sequencing data under a variety of conditions. You can use it to compare, compare the allele frequencies that you would obtain if you computed the allele frequencies directly from the genotypes and then from pool seq data. And with this, you can compute the average absolute difference between both sets of other frequencies. And so see what uh, pool sec conditions so, uh, will give you um, accurate estimates of the other frequencies. And you also can convert the simulated pool sec data with you using the pool helper to other formats that can then be used in further downstream analysis. Maybe you can go faster here. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so we start the, how do we simulate pool seq data? Um, with pool helper, we basically implemented the constant based simulation of a single population at equilibrium. We obtained polymorphic sites for each simulated locus under these constant based simulations. 
We then obtain the allele frequencies computed directly from genotypes by counting the total number of derived alleles per each site and divided by the total number of gene copies. And then we simulate pool seek data using that uh, uh, method than those distributions that Vita showed you previously. And then we compute the mean absolute error between the both sets of allele frequencies. Um, so calculated as the sum of absolute errors divided by the sample size. So to use pool helper, you don't really need any special input sizes to compute the mean absolute error, which you just have to have a general idea of which cover depth of coverage, pool size, and pool error you wish to simulate. So and this is an example of the usage where you see you can you just need to define a vector of mean coverages to simulate, and then you simulate the pool size and you give it a pool error value. Uh, error value and this pool error is related with um, an equal individual contribution that Victor explained earlier. But then if you want to use pool output to simulate pool seek data for further downstream analysis, you need to supply genotypes to the, to, the, to the package functions. And this can be supplied in this format where you have a list where each entry is a different locus and the, the genotypes are coded as zero, ones, or twos. And then pool seek data, pool helper simulates pool seek data um, output it in a list format where you have different entries, entries uh, with the number of reads with the reference allele, with the alternative allele, or with the total coverage per site. And this can then be converted to VCF or SYNC files, which can be used to analyze simulated data with other downstream methods. So this is just a quick example to show you what kind of results and what kind of um, um, things you can look for with the pool helper package. And this is showing you that if the pooling error is uh, high, so it, in this case, it was fixed at 250. And if you sequence a pool of 100 individuals, where each individual is uh, where, where we vary the mean coverage, so from 20x to 50 to 100 to 20, so 200. 200, yes. With two with different expected contributions of each individual, you basically can see that if the pool error, pool error is high, that uh, increase doubling the coverage does not lead to um, uh, to the to halving the the mean absolute error of the estimate. So, might not be um, financially well. It might not make sense to to pay more for the sequencing one and not obtain more accurate estimates. So, yeah, so, and can we have two more minutes to finish or should we finish now? You can have two more minutes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So then uh, basically the final goal was to combine the, these um, uh, package that allows you to simulate pulsic data with uh, demographic inference. So, and um, we did this for three different um, models. So the single origin parallel origin scenario that I already uh, mentioned, but we also included in in our in our study uh, simple two populations isolation with migration model. And so this combination of pool seek data with demographic inference is also available in another R package called pool ABC, which is available on CRAN and in this more detailed in this uh, publication that we had. And so this package is basically an implementation of approximate Bayesian computation methods to um, specifically aimed at using pool sequencing data. And our, our goal was to facilitate the use of pool seek data to perform model selection and inference of demographic parameters. So if yeah. this package can do a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff. It can help you to simulate data for two of a population model. It can compute a set of summary statistics for the simulated and observed data, and allows you to perform model selection and parameter estimation, and also to perform cost validation for those for parameter inference and for model selection. So basically, for this package, we use pool sequencing data stored on these RC formats, which are files created by a function of the pool population 
It's a software which we, which is normally used to analyze pool sequencing data. And this is the basic format of one of those files where we, we have the um, SNP positions and you have kind of a number of reads of the major allele and the minor allele for each population that you have on the data set. And so if you, use, if you want to use the pool ABC package to perform simulations, you need to define the mean and variance of the coverage, and then you define all other parameters as the minimum and maximum of the prior execution, and the package runs the simulations and computes the summary statistics for you. And then you can use other functions in the package to perform model selection and uh, parameter inference. So briefly, and then to finish, Quickly, so the idea behind the, our work was that pool sequencing offers a cost-effective way of sequencing uh, populations across multiple locations, while a proxy location computation is a powerful way to explicitly contrast different demographic models and allows you to tailor your demographic models to your knowledge of the focal species and to the research questions that you are interested in. And so if you combine, combine pool sequencing with ABCC, it, it, uh, it's a powerful tool to investigate demographic models with gene flow, which was kind of what we did throughout my PhD and what I did throughout my PhD. So, and this can combination of pool sequencing with ABC can be done using the two packages that we developed, so pool helper and pool ABC. And this allows you also to um, construct suitable new models for understanding the genetic basis of divergent adaptation. So to design models that you can then use to test the further and more complicated hypotheses. And so I guess that is yeah. yes. So yes. thank you. And we want to thank Roger Butlin and Rui Faria, uh, who are the co-supervisors of now and Hernan Morales that was involved in generating pulsic data. Just to say that also, uh, I'm looking for a postdoc if there's someone interested to develop methods of dem demographic history and hybridization. And also, just to say that there are two vignettes that Sean prepared for the R that we will add to the slides and that we can then share. Um, I mean, there's already vignettes in the CRAN, uh, website uh, explaining the methods, but unfortunately we didn't plan well the time. <laughs> so there was no time for the R demo. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Victor and Joao for a wonderful seminar. We have a bunch of questions. So I'll go ahead and start directly. So Steven Van Bellingen uh, says, great seminar. Do you think there is a way that face to face or upload type information can be included in the pool seek. And he points out that for them, it could be interesting to trace, trace frequency changes of clonal Daphnia water fleas in a population. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, the group of Christian Schlotter uh, working with uh, experimental evolution in Drosophila, they have developed ways to try to phase data based on pool seek. So to estimate the phase data, having so estimating the wheel frequencies at more than one SNP and, and see their correlation. So I think it's possible. Um, for this type of inferences, um, it'll, int it'll, int it'll introduce uh, the challenge of modeling recombination, which we are currently ignoring. So we are just assuming that uh, that we have regions of like 1,000 or 2,000 uh, base pairs. And we are assuming that there is no recombination in that region. Base pairs. So we didn't account for long. Uh, for longer. Yes. Yeah. OK. But uh, there are uh, some methods that at least try to phase mm -hmm. data with Pussy. So it's possible. So it is possible. OK, great to know. So. Teresa has a question also. Uh, she asks, how much data SNPs would be enough to get reliable results from pulsic data given the extra biases compared to individual genotypes? No. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't really know by heart how many SNPs we used because we kind of 
as Vitor was mentioning, we and this was something we didn't have really time to explain, but we went with to look at genome-wide, uh, from genome-wide ABC analysis, we kind of went into an approach where we basically uh, simulate um, um, sequences of 2,000 base pairs, and we do this millions of times. Uh, so at each simulation, we had I think 300 loci, and each of those loci had 2,000 base pairs, and I, I don't really know how many SNPs, I think um, 50 yeah. something SNPs per sequence, and so we did this a million times, so we, which is... Yeah, but I, I think, yeah, so it's always explaining the details just to say that um, um, I think overall, you you would need in this case it was pools of hundred individuals. Okay. okay. So you had four populations with pool of hundred individuals each, uh, where the coverage was uh, around hundred as well. So hundred x at each of these four populations, and with that type of settings, Joan showed that it is possible to infer and and do the model comparison. Um, and I think overall you had maybe it was more than half a million SNPs, right? Yes. So yeah, so half a million SNPs across the chain. So just to give you a number. Uh, and I don't want to go into complications. <laughs> yes. Uh, comparing with individual genotypes, that's a very good question. Uh, that it was, of course, um, Part of the plan on the to-do list of John thesis, but that was not done, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we don't have results of that direct comparison. Okay. Yeah. But the the principle is that with individual genotypes, it should always be better, right? Then certain your your posterior distributions should be more narrow, um, and but we didn't quantify how much. Yeah. So it's a great question, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have, we don't have results to answer that. So uh, connected to that question about the individual genotypes, I was wondering if someone, for example, has RATSIC data or some individual genotypes but wants to move because of uh, budget constraints or whatever to PULSIC, would it be possible to include that information to design the the project in a pool helper, for example, so you can know, okay, now I want to move to pool seek. How would I do it? Already I have like some individuals uh, with individual genotypes. Can you use that information? Yes, I mean, sure. Yes, yeah, so because you, and and for instance, uh, we have, I have another PhD student, uh, Beatrice, and now she's designing, so she wants to do pool seek because she doesn't have enough money to, sequence everything, mm -hmm. and she's using pool helper based on genotype data that she already has based oh, on whole genome. So she knows already that I have some a little, I have some data, and you can mm -hmm. simulate uh, to see uh, how many, what should be the depth of coverage that you use. And our aim, of course, is always to minimize the depth of coverage. Because okay. that's the expensive part, right? So we want to to find what is the depth of coverage we should use. But yes, yeah, so it's possible. Yeah. If you have genotypes, you can use them as input to simulate pulsing data and then see if the allele frequencies you obtain at the end match what you would expect okay. and you, what you already have from your individual. Yeah. Okay. Great, that is really good to know. I think that's really helpful for people that is starting designing yeah. experiments. I don't know. And... Yes, I don't know. We didn't include that slide in the talk, but it's very counterintuitive. So for instance, okay. sometimes, and in the paper uh, of Pool Helper, you can see an example where you get the same error if you have a pool of 200 individuals with a depth of coverage of 50. Mm -hmm. So more individuals with less coverage. Than having 50 individuals with the coverage of 50. So okay. for the same coverage, it's always better to have 
uh, more individuals, which for me was very counterintuitive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but because of this unequal contribution, yes. the more coverage you have, uh, and if you have less individuals, the more you increase that error. Oh, the error, right? yeah. So that's why initially, when I was talking with Beatrice, we were like, okay, so if you have a pool of, she's working with ants, if you have a pool of 80 ants, we should have a depth of coverage of, let's say, 160, mm -hmm. twice the number of individuals. Yeah. But it turns out it's better to have a lower depth of coverage. Lower depth of coverage. So or, you don't increase the error in the contributions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Good so it's, that's why it's, uh, we needed pool helper. <laughs> Well, but it's good to know, uh, like having that tool really helps to process that information. So I'm going yeah. to switch to Jose's uh, Melo Ferreira's questions. So he says, great talks, thanks. Going from demography to selection sweeps, uh, going from demography to selection, sweeps cause local shifts in the AFS, which can be detected with PULSIC as well. But this is influenced as well by the sources of error. As far as I know, Pool seek takes into account coverage and base quality, but not other potential sources of allele bias. Uh, I, he says as well, I think, would you see your approach applicable to understand local shifts in the site frequency spectrum and how match bias can be expected if we don't consider all sources of error? Yeah, great question. Uh... We don't have the answer because we haven't done it, but uh, maybe Joan. Yeah, so so I, the question is the impact, if we can use uh, the SFS or real frequency spectrum based methods that are widely used to detect sweeps uh, or to detect selection with pulse data. I don't know Joan, if you want to comment on that. Um, I mean, it it falls outside of what I what I have done, but yes. Uh, so as Peter mentioned, said we don't. I don't really have a, an answer, but I think it should be it should be possible. But I don't see. It. Yes. Um, so the thing is that the definition. So um, and I guess that we have some clues that it might work at least in the models of Shuang. You include barrier yeah. loci, which will be due to Those divergent yeah. selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that so basically, yeah, very briefly, it was we included a uh, percentage of simulated lossy where we didn't, uh, where we explicitly set the migration to zero between the divergent epitypes. And so, and then we tried to infer what was the proportion of the genome, or what was the proportion of simulated lossy where we have no migration, kind of a proxy for burial lossy, and all that particular parameter was um, very well estimated most of the time. So it should be possible to infer some, um, I guess uh, it's also, I'm also uncertain because we use this kind of uh, zero one approach. So it was either migration or no migration. And so it's different than what you would expect under a selective sweep. But I guess it should be yeah. And, and just also to add on that question that uh, João and we implemented several summary statistics, uh, but not the site frequency spectrum. So we still didn't explore site frequency spectrum, but it should be straightforward to, to further include that. But we have a list of I don't know, 40 summary statistics that are functions of the wheel frequency spectrum, but not the, the yeah. Yeah. So Jose had another question, which I think you already answered because he, he says, so your advice is increase number of individuals rather than sequencing depth to increase accuracy. So we already yes. talked about yeah. that um, before. So uh, we have like one minute left. I have one curiosity. Um, do you know why it worked better for the single origin than the parallel origin, like the, uh, the distribution? Because it was quite different. Uh, the prediction error, right? Yes. That, yes. That was um, only because it's, uh, I mean, without showing you the model again, it's only because that particular parameter we were referring to. In
engine model, that parameter was confounded by migration. Okay. Uh, types which did not occur in the signal origin yeah. model. Yeah, so it was when you have, in general, when you have gene flow between populations, yeah. it's yeah, become harder from. to estimate the time of it. And of course, if there was parallel origin with gene flow, you're trying to estimate the gene flow and the time of split at the same time. In the single origin, there's gene flow, but it's gene flow be between it's very different yeah. populations. Gene populations that do not share a single ancestral. Yeah. So it's much easier to estimate the time of split. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So there are no further questions, and it's already 1 p.m. So yeah. thank you so much for the talk. It was fantastic. And uh, that's it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. See you at the next seminar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.